We have patch notes for Season 2 going live. Isn't that going to be fun? So, big changes, new hero. What's going on? Well, first things first, we have the new hero, Ramatra. They are a tank that is probably going to make Q times even more brutal, but you will not be getting this hero until rank 45 on the battle pass if you have not paid. That is down from rank 60, which is where Kiriko was, but most people didn't feel that rank 60 because Overwatch 1 players got her immediately. That said, he does not seem to be meta-defining based on early reports. Uh, that could just be a case like early Sigma people thought wasn't meta-defining, but really they just hadn't figured out how powerful he was, etc. So could be a thing where people start to figure out, oh wait, he's actually really good, and they just don't have the time into him yet. But what we're looking at is, of course, this two-form Omnic, where they've got the ranged form for poke, the close form for brawl, and we can take a look at this. We see they've got their primary fire plus shield in their poke form, then in their nemesis form, they transform, they can shoot with their fists, they sort of do energy projectiles that pierce through stuff, including shields, and then they have sort of a punch uh, shield that they can put up similar to Doomfist with the shield block there for the secondary fire. They've got the Ravenous Vortex, which throws out the ball, explodes when it hits the ground, creating the damaging field, and enemies are slowed and pulled downward. So a way to control enemy flyers there. And then finally, you have the ult, which is, of course, enter nemesis form, swirling energy, surround yourself, lash out towards nearby enemies, all that good stuff. So there we have the ult there. So we're hearing that this hasn't been meta shaping yet. In fact, we're instead hearing that perhaps the meta tank is Doomfist who is going from quite possibly the worst hero in the game to maybe the best tank. And what we see here is a fair number of buffs. We, of course, see Rocket Punch has had a bunch of changes, and mostly what those changes are going to do is they're going to make the impact size of Rocket Punch perhaps a little bit smaller, but they're going to make it so that you can you have this more often. You have this after you've used your ult. You can charge this more easily off your power block. It's going to knock people back we can see knockback radius reduced from four to three uh, we can see impact damage minimum to maximum increased from 15 to 30 to 25 to 50 so that's gone up all sorts of changes that we're seeing here we've got the power block cooldown reduced from eight to seven seconds duration increased from two to 2.5 but you can of course switch that off early if you want do something else and then minimum damage required to empower your rocket punch is now down from 90 to 80. So it's not giving you CC protection, it's not giving you an all-around shield, but it is on a shorter cooldown, you can keep it going longer if you want, and it takes less accidental chip damage to, oops, you've fully charged up the rocket punch here. Meteor Strike now gives you a free empowered punch, and the slow on that is, I believe, back up to three seconds here. So that's going to be hard for some of those slower supports, people who don't have movement, to get out of. The Zen, the Ana is getting dropped on by a Meteor Strike. That's going to be a pretty lasting slow there. Best defense, maximum temporary health increased from 150 to 200, and the temporary health gained per target hit with abilities increased from 30 to 40. This is going to make him a fair bit more durable. He tends to exist on a little bit of a knife's edge, and on this knife's edge, we are now seeing, hey, he's now going to have more health, and he's going to get more health per person hit with each ability. That tends to turn him from, oh, he's annoying, but we can deal with him, to he really isn't really going to die etc at least it has in the past as a tank maybe it'll be different that's just you know going by what he was as dps but this is what we're getting the early reports of sort of being the oh this is really powerful extremely disruptive as a tank we'll see in practice junker queen we've seen some adjustments here her hitbox has been increased by, we see, 12% here. Wound duration has been nerfed on her ultimate, but the ult's cost has gone down a little bit as well, 10% there. And then the cooldown on commanding shout has decreased from 15 to 14 seconds. That could be a pretty big deal. And then adrenaline passive healing multiplier increased from 1 to 1.25 damage dealt by wound. So her hitbox got bigger, but she, to make up for that, has... Uh, an extra second off the cooldown of her commanding shout, and she's going to self-heal more from her bleed. So that's probably a reasonable trade. She didn't really have a tank-sized hitbox, so this is probably appropriate to bring her a bit more up to tank size for people that are shooting at her and kind of expect tanks to be a little bit bigger. That's sort of part of the trade-off here, but she 
potentially isn't net losing survivability here. I don't think this is going to make her hard meta, but we shall see. Bastion. This, so now we're into the DPS, and I have to say I'm not a huge fan of this. Maybe it's just being mean to Bastion. Bastion was one of the weaker DPS heroes, but the problem is he hard, hard punishes people who do not understand cooldown cycles, engagement cycles, whatever you want to call it. So what we've seen here is the cooldown reduction on reconfigure from 12 seconds down to 10 seconds. The way Bastion works is when he has tank form available, that's basically another ult on the board. It's an ult with a duration of, hey, you do not want to push the opponents while they have tank going, or and you don't want to commit while they have tank available unless you're going to just overwhelm them with ults, instantly delete them with a pulse bomb, something along those lines. So it tends to be a poke him, pressure him, prod him, but be able to jump out, etc. until he gets antsy and forces that tank form. And then you have to go in and fight him. You have to go in and fight him during those 12 seconds that he doesn't have the cooldown. But now it's only 10 seconds. And sure, 10 seconds is still a decent amount of time, but I suspect this is going to turn Bastion into a basically free ticket through the metal ranks for DPS heroes. Because I do not think people have a good enough grasp of how pressure cycles work, of how to not int into the Bastion before tank mode and how to get that tank mode. And then just they have to go even if they're not comfortable, even if they're down cooldowns and health themselves while that tank form is isn't available. So we shall see. This will not affect the professional meta, but for much of ladder, I think this is going to make Bastion a terror. We've also seen changes to his ult. Delay before projectile drop reduced from 1 to 0.6 seconds. That's a pretty big shortening that we're seeing there. Explosion damage reduced from 300 to 250, so a little bit less damage since it's coming down quite a bit faster. No longer deals damage to self with those, and minimum delay between placing shots reduced by 20%. So you can drop them a fair, uh, little bit faster, they do a little bit less, and they come down after targeting them quite a bit faster. This hero is going to be a free ticket through the through the metal ranks like I, I would be very surprised if it's not or the player base is going to very quickly learn about pressure cycles and i just don't believe that okay then we get on to sojourn and these are probably the right nerfs for her so first off we're seeing how long she can hold a charged up railgun is down from eight to five seconds that is helpful definitely i would have been perfectly fine bringing it down to four her secondary fire so the railgun now has fall off at 40 meters instead of 70. Lore-wise, that doesn't make a ton of sense for a railgun, but this starts bringing air her out of the territory of competing with the snipers, and considering the mobility that she has and the strength of her primary fire, she needs to be in less competing with sniper territory, or she needed something to happen, and I think this is a good direction. And further, to make her less compete with the snipers, we're seeing the secondary fire critical damage multiplier is reduced from 2 to 1.5. Secondary fire damage now scales from 30 to 130, one-to-one -one conversion there, uh, you know, energy to damage. So she, I believe this means now doesn't one-shot squishies when fully charged, even within the 40 meters. It'll be very close, and if you were doing primary fire damage to that squishy, you're still going to kill them. She's still absolutely going to be valid to go charge up your primary fire, finish charging your primary fire, hitting someone, railgun, body shot, kill them. That'll still clearly work, but her ability to go, hey, I charged up my railgun on the, t or I charged up my railgun on the tank, and then I pivot over and one shot the squishy. Nope, they're not quite going to get one shot there, it looks like, and you're also not going to be able to go, oh, and let me just hold this railgun for eight seconds and then one shot the widow, the Hanzo, when they peak at 55, 60, 70 meters to try to shoot me. So that is something that I think is good. It gives her a slightly more narrow defined role when she was doing a little bit too much of everything too well. She is still absolutely going to be a valid Soldier 76 substitute, that sort of range, similar mobility. Obviously, they function a little bit different. Um, I think she's still going to be quite good. I do not think this dumpstered her, but I think she has a more confined range to play in now. Overclock energy charge rate increased by 20%, so they gave her some more ult power to help make up for that. Makes sense to me, as well as some extra projectile fire damage, 9 to 10. Symmetra, they're turning back into the sort of tank buster feeder, etc., where her she's got what looks like nerfs in that beam charge rate and decay rate increased by 20%, so okay, you ramp up and down faster. Primary fire ammo consumption rate from 7 to 10 per second, so she's going to use her ammo faster, but... 
her primary fire gains her ammo when attacking barriers again. Now, this is just an anti-barrier play. The thing to remember here is this is this gets us in the situation where you're playing into a more ta more often now into games where the enemy tanks don't have barriers. You're playing into a Doomfist, which may be meta. Well, there's no barrier to ramp up off of. You're playing into an Orisa, which is a perfectly valid valid tank. There's no barrier to ramp up off of. You're playing into a Wrecking Ball. You're playing into a Roadhog. There hasn't been a ton of Wrecking Ball, but into a Roadhog. You're playing into one of these three tanks, which may be pretty common, because Hog comes into even more commonness when Doomfist comes up, especially since he can't block CC, and she's not going to be able to ramp up off of these. So, I get it. This does return her a little bit more to her role, but there aren't as many barriers with only one tank on the board and with more tanks designed to function as the solo tank without barriers. Tracer, we see in the comments that her falloff bug has been is gone, so she's now going to have earlier falloff than she did in the past, but her damage is back up from 5 to 6. So, she's going to have more close range ability to just assassinate people, delete them, but she's going to be a little less chippy poke damage at range there, and Tracer players are going to be fine with that. This may be the return of hard Tracer meta. Uh, it quite possibly could with that pulse damage thing, because it gets more ability to one-clip people, more damage when you're in range there. Anna seeing a slight increase in terms of her cooldown, reduced from 15 to 14 seconds on Sleep Dart, so she gets a little bit of help there, which is probably appropriate. And Kiriko has seen her path nerfed. Gate needed to be nerfed. This makes sense. Ultimate cost increased by 15%. Movement speed boost from it reduced from 50 to 30%. Cooldown rate increase reduced from three to two times faster. So you get your cooldowns back a little slower. The ult costs a little bit more to get going, and the movement speed de increase is down to only 30%. So those are some nerfs to the ultimate. They were necessary. I think this is still a very, very very powerful ultimate, but hey, move in the right direction here. And then they've tried to give her some compensating buffs. Her arm hit volume width reduced by 15%. I believe that means the hitbox on her sides effectively has been shrunk a little bit. And then her protection Suzu, which can feel a little bit slow to trigger, is had its cast time reduced from 0.15 to 0.1 seconds. She's also got a little more ammo on her kunai there. So if you're just sort of throwing kunai into a choke between paper throws, between healing people, you should be able to do that for a little bit longer without running into an annoying reload. So she got some power back into her kit to try to partially compensate for the ult nerf here the ult nerf does look bigger than the power she got back in her kit but she was the best support really she was you know pretty this is the best ult in the game i think this is probably pretty good i don't think it hard throws her out of the meta i think we're gonna have to see what the meta looks like now mercy changes are just really really weird we see faster weapon switch speed and ammo increase from 20 to 25 people who are playing mercy don't really want to be using her blaster a bit if they've stuck with mercy this long that's sort of like no they've opted out of that that's not to say that you know there aren't good mercies out there who can go hey pull out the blaster and absolutely go hey uh, style on the GM DPS. Sure, they absolutely exist, but I don't think this is really going to appeal to the mass mercy community there as a way to buffer, etc. I do know that they're saying that, like, oh, her win rate is very good, perhaps even, you know, even better than Kiriko until top 500, etc. But if you look at the actual powers of the hero when they're played correctly, she, she needs something that is not this. Giving her weapon more ammo, giving a slightly faster weapon speed swap, that's not going to be the solution. So that is what we are looking at for the patch here. It's an interesting one. Definitely let me know what you think. Do you think people are sleeping on Ramatra? And he's actually going to be great. The ability to ground flyers, that ult, those punches that have some depth to them. Do you think we're just in the doomfist godfist meta where he's just gonna roll people disrupting them all the time messing them up not going down himself with that extra over shield with those more common empowered punches with the lower cooldown longer duration on power block is is that what we're looking at have we seen the return to full-on tracer meta that sort of thing with hey she's got her damage back I'm definitely curious what you guys think. Uh, this could be a really interesting one. I don't think we're going to see, if I had to just put out way too early guesstimates, I would say Bastion is going to dominate the lower and middle parts of the ladder. Sojourn is still going to be quite, quite good. 
Symmetra is not going to work. Tracer may return to her full-time status. We're probably going to see quite a bit of Kiriko still played. We may see her work her way into that position where it's her plus another heavier healing support. Because, hey, now you don't have quite quite so much emphasis on Kitsune Rush. But she could stay. It could still be her Lucio. That would not shock me. These mercy changes do not matter. So, yeah. That's sort of my first look at this. If you're enjoying the content, drop a like. Consider subscribing for more thought-provoking Overwatch 2 content. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks, Temporal Out.